just before Jericho. Joshua won the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua won the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. You like that song? Part of that would be a good one for us to sing, wouldn't it? Maybe Brother Rod was on the bass and back there somewhere where he was at. But I enjoyed with being with the choir these uh, few months that we've been with them. And, uh, you know, Jericho beats uh, aimlessly wandering around in the wilderness by far. And that's what these children have been doing for 40 years, wandering around, much like a, a boat with only one oar in the water, and they're going around and around and around and around. And basically the simple reason is because they refused to go over and possess the land and they had a vote. You know, Baptists like to vote. And uh, who said that you have to vote about things? Where have you ever found that in the Bible? Can anybody find where the church voted other than for Matthias? I think they drew lots for him or whatever, uh, threw lots or whatever they did with the dice or whatever it was. I don't think it was godly. Matter of fact, I think that's why Paul came let later because he was a man. He said he was an apostle out of due season. And he'd seen the Lord on the Damascus Road. I don't think God was for Matthias and all that dice gamble. I don't think that's God there for that anyway. But uh, that's another story. But I do know this, that it was because of the disobedience of God's people uh, that they went to Kate. They went right up to the edge of Kadesh Barnea. They looked over into what they could have. They sent those spies into the land. Only two came back positive and ten negative, and they took the advice and the counsel of those ten negative spies, and thus they forfeited the right of the children uh, of those people. Forty years they wandered around aimlessly, around and around and around, and they saw all kinds of things out there in the wilderness. They saw death. They saw destruction, they saw wars, they saw the earth opening up, they saw those venomous vipers that bit them, that Moses had to lift the brazen, uh, the, uh, brazen pole in the, in the wilderness. They saw uh, golden calves uh, made by uh, Aaron and different ones, and, and, and they saw immorality at the height of the level uh, that you and I would not even understand. And they saw all of that, and you know what? It looks like God, after all of this, is about to, uh, to send them over into the promised land. He promised it to them. And I will say, first of all, tonight God keeps his promises. Amen. We sang, Great is thy faithfulness tonight. Uh, I love praising God for the faithfulness of our Lord. But I will say this, we're not so faithful. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I do see the promise of God that he would give them a land which floweth with milk and Honey. Isn't that wonderful to think about? The, the promised land is never a type of heaven. I want you to realize this. The promised land is always a type of the perfect will of God. Why? Because they had continued warfare over there. They had death. They had disease. They had all those problems over there. And, of course, we know we're not going to have those problems when we get to, uh, to glory land. Praise the Lord. And so uh, uh, the thought is tonight they should have gone over in to possess the land. They, they shouldn't even have to pray over whether or not it was right or not at Kadesh Barnea. You know, there's some things in your life that you don't have to pray about. You don't have to pray whether it's right uh, to be saved. Upon making a public profession of faith in our Lord, you don't have to pray about getting scripturally baptized. It's right to do. Furthermore, it's, uh, you don't have to pray about whether or not you should open your mouth for the Lord and make a bold witness for Him. If pastor can do it about five times a week, you can do it too. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hey, you don't have to pray about whether or not to go to Sunday school or not. Come on and join us. Amen? Hey, you don't have to worry and pray about whether or not, uh, you know, uh, that uh, uh, we should keep the commission or not, sending these missionaries around the world. We're about to perform the doing of all of this. We don't have to vote on that, church. Matter of fact, we're not going to vote on it. We're just going to do it. Amen? You, you, did you know you vote uh, every Sunday whether or not you still want to send missionaries around the world by being here or not being here? You make the vote. You make the vote on whether to keep this church going here at this Temple Baptist Church by whether or not you come or don't come. You still make a vote. By the way, it's a negative vote if you don't come, praise the Lord. It's a positive vote if you come and you participate and you pray and you make things right with God and you are participating in the work. Oh, listen, we, we are honored that we get to have a little part in the work of the Lord. Isn't that a blessing? 
I say it's a real blessing. I say if you're in America tonight, you're really in the promised land. Let me just say why I believe that. This is where the gospel has been freely preached for however many years that we've been here. Churches have thrived. And we're in the promised land spiritually where these uh, Israelites were in the promised land physically. I'm saying that this country has sent more missionaries than any other country. I mean, don't you ever have a bad day. You're living in America. I mean, you're living in the most blessed land. Uh, I heard one uh, guy from uh, New York, Mr. Como, I think was his name. He said that America had never been great. You know what I want to do? I want to go up there and whoop that man for saying that. You know why? Because this is a great land. This land is my land. This land is your land. From Cal you've been to California? You've been to Washington State? You've been to Oregon? You've been all the way out there and all the way this way? You'll see the great expanse of our country. Beautiful country God's blessed us with. And oh my, my, if we ever get down, if we ever get discouraged, if we ever throw in the towel and say, hey, you know what? God's finished with us. Shame on that. You know why? Because God is good and God's still keeping his promises to his children. I mean, he can take us up to another high level if we'll let him. It's not over. Don't believe the negative people. Don't believe those, uh, those uh, naysayers that say that we can't have revival. Who said we can't have revival? It's a bunch of baloney. Tell them I said so or malarkey, whatever that is. I might have to look that up in the dictionary and find out what that is. I know that <laughs> maybe something. Hey, look, God still keeps his promises. Shame on the preachers that don't believe we can have revival. You know, I don't blame the people. I blame the leadership. You wonder if Moses, why Moses couldn't go over into the land. You know, but God wouldn't let him go over there. You think God might have hung that on Moses? The reason they had to go around and around, hey, he shouldn't have listened to that negativity. He said, ah, we're going on anyway. Right. Amen? Yeah. He wants bold leadership. We need bold leadership in this day. Let me tell you what happens on Wednesday night here when we go out in Jesus' name, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's bold leadership. Right. I'm talking about talking to people. I'm talking about try. I'm talking about just cold contact and knocking doors. Look, we've had some of the best experiences out there. We're living in the deep south. People are friendly, folks. Hey, while we still have opportunity to knock doors and to talk to people, did you know there's coming a day they're going to call it hate speech? They're going to call it discrimination. They're going to call it proselytizing. They're going to call it something, some kind of law. Matter of fact, my son-in-law made this statement to me in the wee hours of the night one night. The, the city council down here was going to pass this kind of bill that stated that people could not go door to door with the gospel or anything else. They couldn't sell anything. They couldn't bring anything to your door. And my, my son-in-law was wakened in the night. He went down there, woke up out of sleep, and said, Have y'all lost y'all's ever-loving mind? We live in America. This ain't Russia. Yeah. Amen. Dan Carr Jr. took up for the right to go door to door. Hallelujah. Amen. We need some of that bold leadership. You know, people will run over you as long as you let them. We need to stand up. But look, can I say this? If you're not going door to door in the peacetime, I promise you when they pass the law, you know what Dan Clark told him? He said, you can pass all the bills you want to, but we ain't listening to the bill. What are you going to do, throw us all in jail? Bunch of stupid people making a law saying we can't do this book right here. That's what they're upset about. They, don't, they do not want us to fulfill this book right here. Good night. They told me that in Greece that we couldn't uh, pass out literature and witness to people on the street. Guess what? I wasn't listening. I did it anyway. And then what are they going to do? Throw an American in jail? For what? For giving out what? A free, something free? Did it cost anything? Good night. What are we afraid of? Listen, you can let fear grip your soul and not talk to a soul, or you can get faith and go ahead and say something for the glory of God. And guess what? The chances are you may be the only one that ever gives them the gospel. I'd rather just go ahead and take my chances, have you? They hadn't thrown me in jail yet. And if they did, you know what? I think we could get a revival out of the jail. I think I could summons all of Temple Baptist Church, and we'd have church down there at the county jail. Brother Roloff did that. Told him that he was going to have to license his 
uh, schools and, and his homes down there in Corpus Christi, Texas, and they did a, a series of uh, preachings uh, over the radio uh, live from his jail cell. Stirred up the whole country. Woo! Hallelujah. <laughs> I tell you, we need some brave, bold Joshua. He was a general in the army of the Lord. I'll say secondly, Joshua first had uh, to uh, circumcise all of these males who were not uncircumcised. You'll see it uh, seven through eight. Moses' wife said, you're a bloody bridegroom. Moses, this is what Zephora said, and a bloody religion some have said that we have with Christ on the cross. And the putting away of the flesh is an act of faith on the part to separate from the rest of the world and coming apart to worship our Lord. It always has been a symbol of that. Jesus said or in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians, you'll find it. Come out from among the world and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. The problem is uh, when it says touch not, taste not, handle not, we've been doing way too much of all three of those things. So at this point, the Lord, he rolled away the reproach of evil off of them. Verse number nine, you'll see this. He saw where they were uh, where they were serious. They got down and they made decisions for Christ and uh, for the Lord. And they, they did away, they put away uh, this flesh. They put away the reproach of Egypt uh, off of them in verse number nine, where it says uh, that the, uh, it, the uh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. And the Lord said unto Joshua, this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Wouldn't it be a good thing? Wouldn't it be a wonderful day when you could have the reproach of sin to be rolled off of your back? Well, you're talking about relief. How do you spell relief? That's when God rolls away this reproach uh, from off of you. Egypt is always a type of sin, and sin has to be dealt with, and, and the flesh has to be crucified each day in order to have this reproach of the world off of you. You know, we can't carry this guilt and shame and reproach that's attached to the sins that we commit. We cannot carry that. Right. Only the Lord can carry that. And the peace of God will flood your soul again. You must pick up the knife like Joshua did and do the hard thing. Paul said, I die daily. What does he mean by that? This is not being a dead sacrifice. This is not committing the, uh, the sin of murder to yourself. No, no, no. This is being a living sacrifice for our Lord. Amen. So they had the circumcision 7 through 8. And then the Passover was observed, verses number 11 through verse number 12. And this was the last of the manna that fell from heaven. You notice that God, uh, he uh, gave manna to eat, he gave the quails to eat. But when they got to the promised land, there were no free bread lines. Hello. They're going to have... They're going to have to work over there uh, in the promised land. They're going to have to raise their own uh, props. They're going to have to have uh, the uh, the work of man, that manual is going to have to come back out again, praise the Lord. And this Passover, this was the, the last time to take the Passover in the wilderness. And then again, when they went over and possessed the land. Think about this. The Lord said that the last night that he instituted the Lord's table and the Lord's supper, which was a variation from the Passover, by the way, Jesus was the Passover man. And they're getting ready for Passover. And he's instituting the Lord's Supper from the Passover. And he said that he would not take it again with us until uh, he met us in, in heaven. And we ate, ate it with him anew in glory. And praise God, they ate it, uh, the Passover the last time uh, on the other side of Jordan. And then when they crossed over on the new side, they had it again. Praise the Lord. So one time... We'll have it in the uh, old Jerusalem or the old earth. And then the last time we take the Lord's Supper, we take it every first Sunday, all right? One of these first Sunday night services, we're going to take it for the last time, and then we're going to take it again with the Lord in the air. Won't that be a beautiful thing? Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm saying one time on earth and one time in heaven. And we'll take it one more time on earth. It'll be the last time to do so in remembrance of our Lord's death until he comes then. Uh, we'll, uh, praise the Lord, uh, we'll be overcoming Christians for sure. We'll be in our glorified bodies. Uh, and then uh, if you look at Acts 2.41 sometime, you'll know the things that God requires of us. He said that they that gladly received his word were baptized, added unto the church, 
and they broke bread together and they took the Lord's Supper together. And so these these ordinances uh, were requirement. The requirements to take the Lord the the, uh, the ordinances was that you had to be saved and scripturally baptized and good fellowship, and then you could take the Lord's table. Here's what I think a lot of people do. They think they can come and take the Lord's table. We're not, we're not having the Lord's Supper tonight. But they think they can come and take the Lord's table and just live any way they want. Not get forgiveness of their sin. Not tell the Lord they're sorry for anything they've done. And just go on like it never happened. Friend, you better take care of that. Why do you think we have it so often? I'll tell you why we have it so often. It's where you can get that guilt and reproach rolled off the back of your shoulders. Amen. I mean, God took something from them. But never think God's going to take something from you. He's going to give you something better. He took the manna from them. But the same year provided vineyards that they did not plant. He provided houses that they did not build. And how many of us are tonight living in houses that we did not build by our own hands? Isn't that wonderful? God always has something better for you. Can I say something to someone here tonight? I have no idea who I'm speaking to tonight. Who needs this message? I believe if you'll be faithful to God, God has something so much better for you if you'll just stay faithful. Amen. Don't you wander around in the wilderness wanderings all your life and spin around and around and around and never get the victory over these problems. Good night and morning. Then last of Jesus Christ. Did you see him uh, in verses 13 through 15 of Christophany here where Jesus appeared in the Old Testament to Joshua and he is a warrior with a sword in his sheath. Not your little head. That's how he's going to appear to us in the end. I promise you one thing. You won't want to face this guy right here. He is a... He is a, listen, this is, uh, this is the God of war here. This is Jehovah's Sabbath. And so the Passover was observed. But not only that, Jesus Christ was the Christophany here. And he was there to go in and help them possess the land. Notice after making all these spiritual adjustments, they had the circumcision. They took uh, the Passover lamb and the sacrifice there of all the, that blood to be placed over the lentil. And before the battle of Jericho, the supernatural power of God went in ahead of the congregation, praise the Lord. He did a work that only he could do. Who do you think parted the waters hither and thither and they went over on dry shot? Mm, it was the Lord Jesus. Woo! Who do you think is going to take us up in the chariots of fire one of these days? The Lord Jesus. Amen. Who do you think, uh, after they parted the wall, who do you think made those walls of Jericho fall, fall down flat except for Rahab's apartment? Hmm. I'll give you a hint. The scarlet thread that was lowered down there. You remember the story? Oh, look, there's a blood of trail tonight from Christ on till today. And I heard my son preaching a message from this last week. And he said there's been martyrs, more martyrs since 1900 than all the other centuries combined. So it wasn't just of yesteryear. I'm telling you, people are giving their life tonight for what we have right here and the freedoms we have here in the good old USA. You ought to sit up and pay attention. You ought to thank God every moment. Praise the Lord, God's been extra kind to us. And how, how have we uh, escaped these terrible atrocities? Well, we have thus far, but it doesn't mean that we will continue to escape them. You let our country slip a little further. You let all of our churches end up like hippie churches and see how far we go. God's going to close the curtains. Amen. I want Jehovah's Sabbath on my side. I don't know about you. This God of war. Now look, if you, if you need somebody to take care of you and take care of the problems in your life, you go to Romans 9, 29. Except we had Jehovah's Sabbath, we would have been as Sodom and Gomorrah. Woo! Praise the Lord, the God of war is here for us today. He can protect your children. You say, preacher, how in the world? Why should I have children these days? I'll tell you how you can do it. You can do it with the power of God. Jehovah, Sabbath. Be here for you as he was for these children of Israel. We need the power of God. It's all right, sister. She's just saying amen. That's, oh, that's Jeremiah. He is a man of God, isn't he? Thank you, son. It's okay. It's all right. All right. Hey, he wanted his mama. He's hungry. Praise the Lord. I get that way when I'm preaching sometimes. God is good all the time. 
Ask this question tonight. How do I know which God to worship? How do I know which God to worship? Many people, even in church sometimes, have this, the devil puts this thought, the seat thought in your mind, in your heart. Am I serving the true God of heaven? Let me tell you how you know for sure which one to serve. Satan is not going to attack his own. The true church of God has been the persecuted church all through these centuries. Read the Trail of Blood, read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and read uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Every home ought to have all three of those books. Write them down. Get them from uh, Google it or something. Find out how our Christian forefathers. If you can't get three, just get one of me and recommend it. The Trail of Blood. The Trail. When I first came here as pastor, I taught that little manual. It's just a little book of probably about... Oh, 40 or 50 pages long. I taught that in the adult Sunday school class. And most of the adult class there that I had, their mouths dropped open and their jaws dropped open to know the real history of the Baptist church. You can follow it more by blood than you can by baptism. And millions have died. I said untold, some say as high as 250 million Baptists have given their life for what we here have here today, and some are so callous, and some are so cavalier, and they'll miss here, and they'll miss there, and they'll miss here, and they'll miss there, and they'll come when they want to, and won't come. Look, don't miss it. You're going to miss out. Listen, we're living in the grace age. We're living in the church age. And if you miss out, you'll, you'll be just like those children of Israel out there, missing out on what God had for them had they only gone in and possessed the land. They didn't take advantage of all the blessings that God had for them. Whose fault was it? It wasn't, it wasn't God's fault. It wasn't. I'll tell you how you don't know the true God of heaven, whether or not you're serving the true God or not. The true God will have that drawn sword. He gave us the sword of the Spirit. It's not one we'll cut somebody with. It's right here. Amen. It's the Word of God, which liveth in the body forever. This is, this is our word. This is, this is how we combat the problems of our life. How do we do it? We do it with God's word, don't we? Hey, I don't want to be a pink tea lemonade kind of preacher that comes in here powerless with no answers to perform the doing uh, of the preaching and the prayer requests and such and the winning of lost precious souls. Listen, God gave me four last Wednesday night and it set me on fire. Well, I say that, take that back. I had three. Brother Justin, where are you? He got his first soul out there on the streets of Gulfport, Mississippi. Amen. Come back smiling like a chessy cat when he got back to the van. Amen. You know what God's word said? When they knew it was God answering the prayers of their life, God said, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. If this place had been dedicated for the sole purpose of the propagation of the gospel, I don't want your kids running in this church building. I don't want your people sitting out here on their couches and annihilating these couches and digging in with their pens and such. This is God's house. We ought to be down here scrubbing it. We got some water over here on the floor tonight. Anybody got a shot back? We ought to love the fact, hey, this is where, so if this is where God saves souls, if this is where God does his business in our heart, we ought to value every moment, every second we have to serve the Lord. We have the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know what that means? He's the warrior God. Amen. He's our defense. He'll come and fight your battles for you. Woo! I, should, I promise you one thing. I'd never go to a battle without him. I'd never go to the battle without the King James Bible. You say, preacher, all you do it, you just wrap yourself and you hide behind that King James Bible. Now you're thinking right. Ha <laughs> ha! I promise you, I won't go to a battle with a BB gun when I can have that King James Bible loaded. Better than any 50 caliber you ever find. Woo! I want the Holy Spirit power of my life. How about you? Let's bow for prayer. Father, take what we said here tonight.